Center at Brady Center to pre prevent gun violence and Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital to announce that the state has appealed last Friday's decision by the district court for the Southern District of California that ruled that the state's laws regulating assault weapons are unconstitutional. That appeal is on file. I think we can agree that the, de the decision was disappointing and the reasoning such as equating assault weapons to Swiss army knives and false claims that COVID-19 vaccines have killed more people than mass shootings was shocking. In many ways, the opinion uh, was disturbing and troubling and of great concern. But we cannot be, and we are not, deterred by this ruling. In California, we have long put first the safety of the people who call this state home. Our strong common sense gun laws help curb not only mass shootings, but gun violence as a whole. And with one of the lowest firearm mortality rates in the country, we have to continue to use every tool we have to defend our laws. Those low firearm mortality rates prove that the strong regime we have addressing gun violence in California is working. Many Californians we know choose to own firearms, which is why our laws also respect the rights of those law-abiding responsible individuals. In the wake of the tragic mass shooting in San Jose a few weeks ago, we are sadly and starkly reminded that no one law will put an end to mass shootings and gun violence, but we must continue to do our part to protect the public safety here in California. And if we can take action that is common sense, action that is lawful, action that is constitutional to save lives, we should and we have. We did back in 1989, over 30 years ago, following tragic shootings uh, in schools where children were murdered. The California legislature passed the Roberti Roos Assault Weapons Control Act, which classified specific brands and models of semi-automatic firearms as assault weapons and banned the ownership and transfer of those, those firearms. Then in 2000, an amendment to the law took effect, adding a flexible features-based definition of assault weapons to prevent gun manufacturers from producing functionally identical firearms to the ones that were already prohibited. Now let's be clear, these assault weapons are more appropriate for military use than for self-defense, a fact that has been upheld in court. And over and over, in federal courts throughout this country and even right here in California, firearm regulations involving assault weapons have been upheld as constitutional. The decision in Miller versus Bonta bucks this trend. It is very clearly a legal outlier. And it's fundamentally flawed on the law, on the facts, when it comes to common sense. As of now, the district, the district court's stay of its ruling, a 30-day stay, it remains in effect, which means the ban on assault weapons remains in full force and effect here in California. In addition to today's appeal, my office will ask the Court of Appeals to stay the district court's ruling, which would extend the current 30-day stay of the decision and leave the laws in effect throughout the appeal process. I want to thank our team at the California Department of Justice for their tireless work in defense of our common sense gun safety laws. That includes Deputy Solicitor General Sam Siegel, Deputy Solicitor General Sam Harbort, Deputy Solicitor General Helen Hong, Deputy Attorney General John Echeverria, Supervising Deputy Attorney General Mark Beckington, Senior Assistant Attorney General Thomas Patterson, Acting Chief of our Division of Law Enforcement John Marsh, and Bureau of Firearms Director Luis Lopez, and the entire Bureau of Firearms team. We have a great team at the DOJ. We're going to continue to fight. I thank you for your time and your attention, and it is now my pleasure to turn it over to the great Mayor of San Francisco, Mayor London Breed. I want to start by thanking our Attorney General Rob Bonta for his leadership and his advocacy and jumping right on this issue, a very important issue, not just in our state, but in our country. When you think about what we've been able to accomplish as a result of this pandemic, just think about it. I shut down this city. Our governor shut down this state. People in this country lost their lives to this virus. We acted swiftly 
We saved lives. And now, as a result of this work, we're seeing in San Francisco alone, we're at about 80 percent of San Franciscans who have been vaccinated in this city. And we are well on our way to reopening. And I want to just express my appreciation to the governor for his support, for the resources, for the swift action, for the hard decisions he had to make to get us to this place. And when you think about what we did, how significant that was to deal with this virus, which killed hundreds of thousands of people in this country, the same holds true for guns, period. Not just assault rifles, guns, period. We're here at San Francisco General Hospital. I can't tell you how many times I've been here after a friend that I grew up with was shot. We knew that they would come to San Francisco General so that people like Dr. Andre Campbell could try to save their life. Just imagine that. The school shootings, the places of business, like ha what happened in San Jose just recently and 101 California years ago when I was a kid, constantly seeing these large shooting situations occur and not feeling as judges and policymakers the desire to make serious change. What happened to those kids in Columbine? What happened to so many people who have tragically lost their lives? So the fact that we have had a law on the books in this state for over 30 years, and a judge decides that our law is no longer constitutional, that law has saved countless numbers of lives, just like what we did here in the pandemic and shutting our city down has saved countless number of lives. Just imagine if we didn't shut down how many more people would be dead. So by allowing this judge ruling to occur and walking away and turning a blind eye, it's not an option. Lives are at stake here. We don't want to see another person, another child lost to gun violence in this city, in this state, in this country. We're also here with Maddie Scott. I grew up with her son, and when we were kids, she'll tell you about what happened to her son. Her son should be here right now. He should be here. Those lost lives, they should be here. Just imagine the hurt and the pain of the mothers who have to show up at this hospital only to be told by Dr. Campbell that their child did not make it. Just imagine if that were you. That's what this is about doing the right thing, and that's what we're here today, to do the right thing. And at this time, I want to introduce Dr. Campbell, who I've gotten to know over the years, sadly, because of tragedy. He is just amazing. For years, for years, he has been on the front line when someone is shot in this city, and they come to San Francisco General. He and the folks here are the team that is trying to save those lives. And I will tell you that Dr. Campbell wished that he didn't have to do this work, but it's necessary. And so to, here to talk a little bit about the effects and the impacts of gun violence on the families and, and the people who show up at this hospital to be saved because of, of what we know occurs is the uh, Dr. Uh, Andre Campbell. Thank you, Mayor, for that kind introduction. Good morning. Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, Mayor Breen, and hospital leadership and members of the San Francisco General Hospital community and San Francisco at large. I want to first of all thank the governor for coming out today to San Francisco General. Many of you know he led the effort to get this hospital here approved by leading the way for Prop A, which funded this hospital a number of years ago. I want to thank him publicly for that, for support and all the support he's had for all these years. 
For those of you who may not know me, there's very few of you who do, do not. My name is Dr. Andre Campbell. I'm a trauma surgeon at San Francisco General Hospital. I've worked here with a dedicated administrative staff, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, support staff, dietary staff, taking care of patients here in the city and, camp, city and county of San Francisco. We stand ready 24-7 to work to save your life. You may not need us now, but any given day you may be a victim of trauma and we'll be there for you. We're proud of what we do. We're proud of one of the top trauma centers in the United States and one of the first to be certified as a level one trauma center. It's an honor today to be asked to speak about this important issue of the revocation of a 30-year ban on assault weapons in California. A ban in many ways saved lives in the state of California due to restriction on these weapons. Let me just say this, and I'm going to say this a couple times. An AR-15 is a weapon of mass destruction. It is used in battlefield to kill the enemy. It's a gun that is used in warfare and it should not be available or used in the streets of the United States. To equate an assault weapon to pocket knife is totally wrong. There is no comparison. As a health care provider on the front lines of trauma care for over two decades here, the extent of injuries of one does not equal the other. The assault weapon fires bigger bullets at a faster rate of speed and causes absolute devastation to the human body. It is as if, if a bomb went off in the tissues of the patient, traveling at 3,251 feet per second, these bullets cause cavitation. That means around the bullet there's a large path of destruction that kills people. In simple terms, that means it creates a big hole in people who are injured. The skin, the muscle, the blood vessels, the nerves, the bone, all destroyed as it wreaks total havoc and total destruction on human tissues. Human anatomy is destroyed by these bullets. Many times several bullets strike people and kill them. Tissues are pulverized, permanently damaging people people dying in large numbers. There's no way that a simple pocket knife that you buy at a store can be compared to a weapon of mass destruction. Gun violence should be viewed as a public health crisis in the United States. Last year, 20,000 people were killed in gun-related incidents across the United States. Mass shootings received the most publicity, but major cities like New York, Chicago, Baltimore, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, we have victims who come to this hospital every day Imagine if the equivalent of 40 wide-body wide planes crashed each year, killing that many people. We would ground all the planes in the United States and try to figure out what's going on. We do not have this urgency when it comes to gun violence in the United States. We all remember the names and incidents. You heard some already. The ban in California started after a mass shooting here in Stockton, California, in a school where five innocent lives were lost and many were shot. We've had mass shootings treated here at San Francisco General, including 101 California's head, the YouTube shooting, and many others. You've heard the names Columbine, Sandy Hook, Las Vegas, Miami, last week in San Jose, where nine souls lost their life, and many others around the country. Our hearts break after each of these mass shootings for the victims and their families, some of them here today with us. One recent paper cited in a national publication there was a 70% decrease in mass shootings after the national assault weapon ban over a period of 10 years that it was in place. I do not know how many lives were saved in California from this 30-year ban, but suffice it to say that more people will die because of this ruling. A mass shooting is defined as an event that results in four or more people being shot, and even in the pa biggest pandemic of 100 years, which the shootings persist. The preferred weapon of the mass shooter is the AR-15 with an extended ma magazine, and it results in many deaths in a short period of time. Where the recent mass shootings have used the same kind of assault weapon. And I'll say, obviously, once again, a pocket knife is not an AR-15. Last year, there were over 600 mass shootings in the United States. So far this year, we've had 260. 239 deaths, over 1,000 injuries during the COVID pandemic. This year, there's been 1,600 children who've been shot, 650 have been killed, and many others seriously injured. We've gotten better at carrying the victims after they have shot out the last two decades. We can save a life, but we can't save them all. Each time when I have to go into a quiet room and tell a victim's family that their loved one is dead, it is heartbreaking. No matter what I say, I know the words will 
change their lives forever. Mothers, fathers, brothers all cry out in pain as I tell them this information. When you lose patience as a doctor, I lose a bit of myself. But we must change the way this problem is viewed nationally. This ruling, in the minds of health care providers who provide for care for these victims, will result in more death and injuries. And we must move together to reduce these incidents, promote gun safety laws that make it harder for this type of military-grade weapon not to be on the street. Many approaches have been discussed, but this is a public health emergency in California and elsewhere. In conclusion, as a trauma surgeon, seeing what has happened here over the last couple decades, I view gun violence as a major public health crisis for all Americans. Patients are injured in many mass shootings each year, but we have many victims yet admitted to this trauma center every day that you don't hear about, who are injured, who are maimed, who are hurt, who are killed. The pandemic has not stopped this onslaught of death and destruction in children and adults. This ruling puts more people in danger and does that make us any safer? An AR-15 is not a pocket knife. This is not an AR-15. This is a pocket knife. They are different. This is not a weapon of mass destruction. An AR-15 is. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'll introduce Maddie Scott for the Brady California State President for the Brady Organization. Maddie? Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Thank you to our governor, um, Representative Bonta, and our wonderful Mayor London Breed, who all have been at the forefront on this issue, along with our congressional leader, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. My name is Maggie Scott, and I'm the mother of George C. Scott, who was 24 years old, father of two sons, who was shot and killed July 17, 1996, here in San Francisco with an assault weapon. As a lifelong Californian, a mother, a grandmother, and now a great-grandmother, as an activist for gun violence for over 25 years, I stand here today as a proud president of Brady, California, for racial justice and peace in our city and our country. As the founder of Healing for Our Families and Our Nation and the proud chapter leader for San Francisco Mothers in Charge, an organization of mothers around this country addressing this issue. 25 years ago, my son was murdered here in San Francisco. The case remains unsolved. I miss him every day, as do his children, his brother and sister, and the rest of my family. That is why I cannot remain silent about this egregious decision in federal court last week to strike down our state's common sense and constitutional assault weapons ban. Let me be clear. The judge who issued this decision is wrong. It's wrong. He is ideological. His actions have threatened the safety of our state, its residents, and the integrity of public safety laws across our country. It is insulting to read his decision where he called the kind of weapon that killed my son akin to a pocket knife. Pocket knives were not invented to kill as many people as possible. Pocket knives don't tear families apart. They don't shoot up schools, churches, movie theaters, and street corners. It wasn't the pocket knife that took nine precious lives in San Jose at the VTA. Pocket knives don't kill three people and wound 17 others at the Gil Ward Festival that we all love to attend to each year. I have worked every day since George was killed to keep our state and our community safe from gun violence. I have buried too many friends and family because of gun violence, including last year during the height of the coronavirus pandemic. It wasn't a pocket knife that took Mother Stephanie Birch's second son, Corey McCorey Sr., who we will have to lay to rest this Saturday. It wasn't a pocket knife that killed Paula Henderson's all in son in Los Angeles. It wasn't a pocket knife that killed Sheila Burton's son, Rashad Leron Williams, 21, and Christian Dante Foster, my nephew, 22, both shot in the back with an automatic assault weapon in Clear Lake. And it wasn't a pocket knife that put 37 bullets in Aubrey Abacasa on August 14, 2006, Paulette Brown's only son. 
Elizabeth Torres Tucson, Alvaro Garcia Pena Torres, August 30th, 20, 2009, and her other son, Francisco Garcia Pena Torres, killed April 16, 2004. It wasn't a pocket knife that killed Yolande, Cinda Miranda, and David Saucer, Harit Atkin, and Manuel O'Neill in the Hayes Valley shooting, where all four of them were gunned down on January 9, 2015. It wasn't a pocket knife that killed Sean Richards' two brothers, and it wasn't a pocket knife that took the lives of Mother Maggie Lord Agnews, who lost all three of her sons two to three years apart in Bayview from an assault weapon. Gun violence affects all Americans, but it disproportionately affects black and brown Americans, including here in California. Despite this, I am here today to tell you that our laws work. The gun homicide rate in California is 30% lower than the national rate. The rate for all firearm deaths is 37% lower in California than the national rate. That is because of common sense laws like our ban on assault style weapons and because of strong, courageous leaders like Governor Newsom here who have championed these policies and defended them. We have strong support from our fierce congressional leader, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, on common sense gun laws to ban assault style weapons in California and in our nation. And we have major support from our mayor, London Breed, and our police chief, William Scott. This is because of courageous leaders that we have here to help us champion these policies and to defend them. Since taking office, Governor Newsom has consistently called for common sense and stronger violence prevention policies while also committing our state funds to invest in our communities and actually heal them. That's leadership and force that a stark contrast to the bl blind dogma that leads someone to compare a weapon that has killed thousands to a pocket knife. Too many people in our community and our city cannot be here today because of gun violence. We're here to speak for them and for their families and to tell you that we are not stop, we will not stop fighting. Attorney General Bonta has already committed to appealing this decision. Governor Newsom has similarly pledged to defend this law. We who work in this movement are with them. We are not going to give up. We will not be under terror. And as Attorney General Bonta said, this decision was fundamentally, was fundamentally flawed. This is about all of us or none of us. We will not let it stand because black lives matter, our children's lives matter, and all of our lives matter. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Thomas. I'm the executive director of the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Our predecessor organization was founded in 1993 after the assault weapon massacre at 101 California Street in San Francisco. This decision today would not only strike down the law in California, which prevents civilians from having access to military style weapons, it also would allow Californians to have access to the type of weapon used in the 101 California Street shooting, an assault pistol. So this decision actually is a really broad one. I'm going to talk for a minute about this specific judge and this decision that was issued last Friday, ironically, on Gun Violence Awareness Day, a day when we respect and honor the lives of those lost to gun violence in this country. And on that very day, this agendized, politicized judge decided to issue a decision striking down a 32-year-old law in California, which has been working. The decision is not based on facts. The decision is not based on the correct interpretation of the law. The decision has been issued by a judge who was handpicked by the NRA to sit in a federal district seat bench. And this is the third time that the same judge has struck down a California law intended to protect the lives of our citizens and to make our communities safer. And let me just make clear that the laws in California, the comprehensive gun regulation, which we have pioneered here in the state, is protecting the lives of California, is making us safer. We have one of the lowest gun death rates in the entire country. Children in California 
are almost half as likely to be shot to death as the national average. If the rest of the country had the same gun death rate as California, 100,000 lives would have been saved in this country in the last 10 years. Those are the facts. Those are none of the facts that you see in this decision. This decision makes reference, false reference, to COVID deaths, makes an astounding analogy to a Swiss Army knife, which he intends to explain that this gun, like a Swiss Army knife, is equally useful on the field of battle and for home defense. And I can assure you that even gun owners, responsible gun owners, don't believe that an AR-15 is the weapon that you want or need for self-defense. The decision literally has no foundational support other than the fact that I don't believe this judge would uphold a single gun law anywhere ever. This is a judge that doesn't believe in regulations to help save lives and help make our community safer. And that is something that I find insulting. And we've been tracking thousands of Second Amendment cases across the country over the last 28 years. Almost all of those decisions, more than 90%, uphold existing gun regulations on the basis of fact and law. This decision is a complete outlier. There are at least six other federal court decisions, federal and appellate court decisions, which uphold similar regulations to California's assault weapon restriction. This is the first one that goes in the other direction and one that is absolutely inappropriate under the interpretation of the Second Amendment that courts across the country are utilizing. Here in California, we have always had courageous leaders. It's why we approach the problem of gun violence as one that has solutions that work. Few people are more committed to that than our governor, Governor Newsom, who's here with us today, our mayor, Mayor London Breed. These individuals take a look at the problem of gun violence in our communities, and they ask the question of what can we do to make our community safer. And we take those steps in California to pass regulations in accordance with the Second Amendment to make our community safer. And this judge seeks to strike down those laws and put our families and our communities at risk. We expect the gun lobby to keep their forum shopping going, to keep trying to get cases in front of this agendized judge who doesn't actually interpret cases with the Second Amendment in mind and to try to get these cases moving up through the federal system. It's something that we have seen before and we don't expect to end today. I just wanna end on a positive note here, which is that I'm gonna wait for the sirens to pass. On a positive note here today, which is that we do have courageous leaders. We are passing laws that make our communities safer. There is a $200 million allocation in our budget that the governor put in, which would be designed to go into communities most at risk to intervene and prevent violence before it happens. It saves so many lives in our communities when we invest in prevention, when we invest in the humanity of people living in our communities who need alternative pathways to peace. So we are constantly taking steps to fill loopholes in the law, to invest in community safety, and to ensure that the future of California, the future of our children, is one where they don't have to fear being shot in school, where they don't have to fear being shot in the street, because we don't give up, because we believe in what's right, and we're not going to allow agendized judges or the NRA's politics of selling more guns to get in the way of that safety. I thank all of you here today who are covering this issue and who understand the importance of this decision and the fact that now on the appeal, we expect the Ninth Circuit to do the right thing and reverse this decision. And I thank Mayor Breed, Governor Newsom, and AG Bonta for their commitment and dedication to this cause. Thank you so much. I'll now introduce our courageous governor, Governor Newsom. Thank you, Ron. I couldn't help when Robin uh, paused just to hear those sirens, how many more sirens we're going to be hearing because of Judge Benita's decision. Uh, I want to just thank uh, the Attorney General for his steadfastness, his leadership, his willingness to take this on immediately, not hesitating, not wavering, and moving courageously forward with this appeal. I want to thank uh, the Mayor, London Breed, for exceptional leadership uh, going back decades on the issue of gun violence and gun safety, gun prevention, uh, and criminal justice reform more broadly. Uh, to Maddie, thank you for uh, 
personalizing, not just your own story, uh, but personalizing so many other mothers who have been torn asunder because of, of crime and violence. Uh, and uh, I want to just thank you for always reminding us what's really at stake. This is about human beings, it's about human dignity, it's about who we are as a city, state, nation, and what we project to the rest of the world, because let's not forget, this doesn't happen anywhere else in the United, uh, in the country, rather any other country in the world. This is unique to the United States of America, and it doesn't have to be. In the spirit of Robin's uh, comments, we're not necessarily just victims of that fate and circumstance. We can shape the future. We have agency. We have the ability to manifest a different outcome, and that's what California has always been about. The modern gun safety movement started here first in a bipartisan way, by the way. May 2nd, 1967, there were 30 members of the Back Panthers that stormed the state capitol. Interestingly, on so many levels, it led a Republican legislator in the assembly to move forward with the state and one of the nation's first gun safety laws, signed by then Ronald Reagan. So when all these guys are standing around in places like Texas, wrapped in the flag and in the spirit and image of Ronald Reagan, they better remember that it was Reagan himself that led this nation, not just the state of California, in advancing gun safety laws. This has always been a bipartisan issue, protecting your kids, our families, our community, for folks that wax on about public safety, and they sit back passively and say nothing about this outrageous decision. Shame on them. What frauds they are. Frauds. They're not serious about violence if they're not serious about gun violence. And if they're not serious about gun violence, and they will not evaluate the absurdity of a decision like this, a weapon of war, nothing more than a weapon of war that's been regulated for over 32 years and sit by passively, not say a damn word, or worse yet, applaud this decision. They're not serious about gun violence in the state, in our nation. And talk about not being serious. Look, I'm a son of a judge. I am very cautious when it comes to attacking judicial decisions. But I sat back and watched decision after decision after decision with Judge Benitez. He's unserious. Judge Benitez, and Matty, you were right, is a stone cold ideologue. He's a wholly owned subsidiary of the gun lobby and the National Rifle Association. Read these decisions. Don't just read the headlines of a judge over it. Read the decisions for yourself. I know it got all the headlines of Swiss Army Knife. Read the rest of this decision. It's ripped off the pages. I, I, you know, If they have an editorial page in Gum and Ammo magazine, might as well be Benita's decisions over and over and over again. And I hope you caught what Robin just said. This was done on a day when we're reflecting the lives of thousands of families that were destroyed because of gun violence, and he chooses to put this decision out on that day. That says everything about his character and the consequences of this decision that are not intellectual, it's not politics, but are emotional and personal to family members who lost their damn lives or their loved ones. Shameful. Shameful in every way, shape, or form. So we'll fight this. Got the right leadership. It's the right state. No other state in America has been more progressive and aggressive on gun safety in the state of California. And we have results to back it up. Gun safety saves lives, period, full stop. The data bears that out. California's laws have led the nation. We continue to lead the nation across the spectrum, not just in 1989 after the senseless shooting of five young people children that were killed, and as Dr. Campbell said, dozens of others injured, we led the nation. Then Senator Feinstein took that model from the 1989 assault weapons ban and made it a national model. And you heard Dr. Campbell make the point. You saw gun violence decrease significantly as a consequence of her courageous act and the act of Congress. Yes, when we had common sense not just gun safety laws, but common sense legislators in Washington, D.C. that did the right thing, had the courage to do the right thing. I don't know if it takes a lot of courage to try to save people's lives, but in this day and age, it seems like it takes some damn courage.
But you don't see that in Washington, D.C. today. And so the state has to continue to lead and fight. And we'll fight. We'll continue to lead. You know, none of this is easy. Days like last week, there's setbacks, but there's opportunity anew. And we'll continue to advance them. I've been proud. In the last couple of years, we've signed dozens of gun safety laws. Then as some remember, Bonta leading the charge in a lot of those. Ghost guns and bullet buttons, issues related to some of the challenges we're having. It relates to gun restraining orders. We need to promote those and work we're doing with gun violence prevention, the 200 plus million in this CalVit program that can help highlight uh, some of those laws that are on the books that we need to promote. We got a lot of work to do, but you need to call folks out and we need to call this federal judge out. He will continue to do damage, mark my word. They are judge shopping. This is a serious moment in American history, not just California history. This is a very focused agenda to work through this judge where the decision's already made before it's even presented, who writes press releases on behalf of the gun lobby and does so knowing that the pr price that we're paying in the short term pales in comparison to the prospect, the price we may pay in the long term if it ends up at the U.S. Supreme Court with this stacked court that went through a vetting process based upon predisposition to know exactly where they're going to land on their quote-unquote expansive view of not only the right to bear arms, but a well-regulated militia. Serious moment, a lot on the line. And I just want to close by thanking those on the front line, like Dr. Campbell, again, for his courage every single day to be on the receiving end of this senselessness, but his need and desire to be here publicly to call it out and to describe what this really is. Is it Aurora? Is it Boulder? Is it Sandy Hook? Is it Parkland? Is it Sutherland Springs? Is it San Bernardino? Is it Poway? You got another 10 minutes? I could continue down that damn list. I said it the other day, what the hell is wrong with us? We're better than this, and this state will continue to fight and continue to lead, and we're gonna continue to do our best to protect those, you know, like Maddie and her family, and thousands of others that are relying and counting on Attorney General Bonta, Mayor Breed, Robin, her team at Gabby Giffords, incredible work that Brady does every single day, and the courage that you see every, every single year in the state of California with remarkable legislative leaders. So I'm honored to be here. I'm saddened to be here, but I'm deeply humbled and grateful by the remarkable people uh, that spoke before me and their extraordinary leadership. And we look forward to uh, answering any questions on this. Uh, but more importantly, we look forward to being successful in this appeal at the Ninth Circuit. With that, Rob, it's always yours. <laughs> any questions? Maybe I'll make a few comments and then uh, the governor can, can make some as well. We're focused on the next step. The next step is filing our appeal, which we did, uh, filing our motion to stay, which we're filing today, and putting our best foot forward and making our best case to reverse the lower court decision, which we find problematic and disturbing and out of touch with the overwhelming weight of federal law throughout this nation and even in this, in this state. So that's what we're focused on. We, I don't want to speculate about what might happen next, whether this case ever gets to the Supreme Court, it may never. And, you know, we're also aware of the U.S. versus Heller decision, which has said very clearly that there are some guns that cannot be sold, manufactured, possessed. Machine guns, short-barreled shotguns. We think that assault weapons, as defined by California's law, fall in that category. So we're going to make our best case at the next level, seek the reversal of which we think is appropriate, and take it one step at a time. I mean, just a, we could have. Robin is truly one of our nation's leading experts 
uh, on this. And also, she made a point, and I think it's an important point, that Benitez still is anomalous. He is not in the mainstream of judicial decisions, upholding these laws over and over and over again, which just reinforces, forgive me, the comments we made about this particular judge. Not the merits, but this particular judge. Uh, Robin, you may want to talk a little bit more about that. Certainly since the confirmation of the last few justices, we know that the NRA and the gun lobby is making a conserved, concerted effort to relitigate many of the issues that have already been decided across the country unanimously, um, in most cases, by our circuit courts. So we have seen in the last few years you know, what is clearly a campaign to get as many cases as possible before the Supreme Court. And the court actually has taken up a case, um, Corlett, which is a case that looks at New York State's, um, New York City's concealed carry permitting scheme. Um, so the court will be looking at that. We have a lot of faith, though, that the Supreme Court, as it has done many times in the past, will take a thoughtful view in interpreting the Second Amendment, even in the Heller decision, which expanded the right beyond anything that it had done before, was a very, very narrow decision. And in the Corlett case, which the court just took up, they took up a question much narrower than that which was sought by the NRA and by the gun lobby. So we have a lot of faith if cases even do get to the court, and the court certainly doesn't even take up a tiny fraction of the cases brought before it, um, that the court will do the right thing and will look at the Second Amendment through the larger lens of history, through the larger lens of what's right for this country, and won't be doing anything to upend what are effective common sense laws. Um, I just wanted to say one more quick thing, which is that assault weapon regulations do work. During the time of the, the federal assault weapon ban from 1994 to 2004 in this country, high fatality mass shootings were dramatically reduced by about 70 percent. And following the expiration of the ban after 2004, high fatality mass shootings deaths went up by almost 300 percent. If you look at the graph of high fatality mass shootings over the last 30 years, it is very clear that assault, wep assault weapon regulations are effective and work to save lives. So I think that's a really important point. The judge references in his opinion the importance of facts matter. But when it comes to actually looking at the facts, this judge is trying to make policy, which is not his job. It is the job of the legislature, and he is stepping far outside of his appropriate behavior and how he's approaching this decision. No, look, I, I think the 1989 law that's been expanded on multiple occasions, updated, um, been a lot of workarounds uh, that included 50 manufactured weapons, restricting the manufacture, sale, import, and possession of these weapons have saved lives. I think it's demonstrably proven to be successful. We want to up and hold this law. We want to continue it to be a model. We want to continue to advocate for federal policies along the lines Robin just stated uh, that have been advanced by our own former mayor. Uh, current U.S. Senator, Senator Feinstein, who's been tenacious on this topic and deserves, again, enormous amount of credit. I also want to applaud former President Clinton as well, I mean, the courage to support those efforts. And so we just want to model uh, success. Success leaves clues. We want to continue to advance laws that not only save lives here in the state of California, but become templates for laws all across this country. Uh, I'm, we make no determination on guilt or innocent, but there was enough ambiguity in the DNA test uh, that I called for uh, to lead to making that decision. Uh, and as a consequence, we have an independent adjudication uh, through a law firm uh, that is not costing the taxpayers a penny uh, to ultimately make a determination. Uh, as you know, I have very strong opinions about death. We're talking about that here today and the death penalty. And I want to make sure it's done fairly, judiciously, without any consideration of bias uh, or prosecutorial misconduct. I'm not suggesting uh, any of that is at play here. I am suggesting that based upon the DNA evidence, 
that came in after I authorized additional DNA evidence to be collected. It was inconclusive, so much so that we made this determination for a subsequent investigation. Governor, quick question on, on relation to about the face mask. Tom Luther last night reversing his decision about masking in the workplace. Now some business leaders are hoping that you may step in before the June 15th uh, reopening date with some guidance about what businesses should be doing Tomorrow, uh, join me down in Southern California. We'll be making specific announcements on this front. But that decision uh, was encouraging, con more consistent with what we've been saying for some time. And, uh, and we'll be uh, highlighting more nuance, not just as it's that decision, but all these executive orders, all these provisions in these executive orders as we wind down, as we move successfully to June 15th, uh, what we can expect in terms of physical distancing requirements, tiering guidelines, uh, maximum occupancy capacity guidelines, masking guidelines across the threshold. Uh, we uh, look forward to making more detailed uh, announcements tomorrow. Commissioner Thank you. Mr. Clerk, you know, California will reopen on Tuesday. Yeah, I will say, just in, in terms of the preview, uh, we are on track. Not only are we on track, again, California consistently has, including today, the lowest case rates in the United States of America, which is a remarkable thing when you consider the state as large and dense as the state of California. It's also interesting, and I hope we're mindful of this as well, that California not only led in terms of health interventions related to this pandemic, uh, but we've outperformed economically. We outperformed Texas. We outperformed Florida. We outperformed the United States of America, not only in terms of health outcomes, but also in economic outcomes. I'm really proud of that, and I think that's important. 390 plus thousand jobs have been created in the state in the last three months, 38% of America's jobs just last month, 38%. America's jobs out of the state of California just last month, the April numbers. We say this often, forgive me, I'll keep saying it as long as it's true. We're not coming back, we're coming roaring back. And that's because of the incredible work that's been done, cities large and small, including the work that was done here in San Francisco and throughout the Bay Area, which has just been magnificent. Are you saying you're opening the state tomorrow, possibly? Is that what you're No, we're on June 15th uh, to move, quote unquote, beyond the blueprint. Uh, and then to express with nuance and more specificity uh, the, uh, the, the, there are a lot of s issues related to all these executive orders. Let me just say that. We have to wind them down. Uh, invariably, people rightfully will be asking, what about this executive order from March of last year, this one from April, June, July? Uh, unwinding not just the executive orders, but the provisions, the expiration dates associated. The state of emergency remains for the same reason it remains in the campfire still to this day. Uh, once a fire is out, it doesn't mean you remove the state of emergency. You've got debris removal. You've got recovery. And that's why we want to be here in the long run on testing, vaccination, supporting local government. Uh, that sometimes gets conflated and misconstrued. I want to make that distinction. But a lot of the executive orders will be announcing uh, subsequent updates. The OSHA decision to make a different decision, encouraging uh, in that respect, and we want to clarify some of that, and there's some questions around timing on that, uh, which go to uh, the question you rightfully asked, uh, but we are on track uh, for moving beyond the blueprint, no more physical distancing, uh, substantially modifying masking in the state of California, moving beyond uh, these county tiers, the red, orange, purple, and increasingly yellow, uh, and uh, now uh, looking forward to uh, getting back to semblance of normalcy without occupancy constraints. Um, you know, there is no panacea for gun violence, especially in a country where we have poor state borders and guns can easily move between states, regardless of how strong California's gun laws are. Um, so we're going to continue to have some problems until we have comprehensive federal reform. And what California is doing in the interim is our best to fill the gaps, knowing that there's only so much you can do without um, it's, it's a problem we see in cities like Chicago and Washington and New York as well, where guns are being trafficked in from states with weak gun laws. And we certainly have that problem in California as well. Um, unfortunately, we also saw an increase in gun violence last year during 
the coronavirus epidemic. People didn't see the mass shootings on the news so much. So there was an impression that gun violence was actually better last year. And unfortunately, we had a relatively significant increase last year, particularly, as you might expect, in areas like suicide and domestic violence. Um, so, you know, I think the exacerbated reality for many people's lives meant an increase in gun violence last year. And now that things are starting to open back up, we're certainly seeing an unfortunate resurgence of mass shootings. I think there's still a lot of tension. There's still a lot of fear. There's still a lot of um, frustration in our community as we're starting to get to normalcy. And we are seeing an increase um, of late. However, we are still at one of the lowest rates in the country. So I think, unfortunately, you have to take a relative approach. Uh, we're the seventh lowest gun death rate of any state in the country, and as the governor mentioned, and that's it, considering the fact that we have such a high population and such a dense population. So we're succeeding. It doesn't mean we're going to go to zero, although certainly we're always looking for ways to make things better. And with a new administration in Washington, it's possible there will be a better approach to preventing trafficking. It's one of the things ATF has not been doing a great job of. They're underfunded, under-resourced, um, and haven't been able to really properly tra track some of the trafficking patterns to prevent it. And that's something that we expect will likely change uh, in the coming year or two with a newly um, nominated director for the ATF that hasn't been confirmed yet, but we expect will be in the next month or two. And maybe I'll just add as well, um, we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Just because we continue to have some instances of gun violence tragedies in the state of California it doesn't mean that what we have done, what we are doing, what we continue to do is not working is in, in, in that it's not good. It is. It's great. It's nation leading. Uh, the data bears that out. You can't controvert it. Um, it it's not debatable. Um, we are limited by the fact that we have open borders between our states and other states around us um, have not taken the same steps we have. If they did, we'd be better off. More lives would be saved. If the federal government took steps on universal background checks, on large capacity magazines, on an assault weapons ban, we would be safer. So we, we need to do what we can do here in California, and we do that by leading, uh, showing what is possible, uh, charging forward in ways that are common sense and, and thoughtful and effective and constitutional and lawful, and we need to always look at the tools that we have. The, the, the environment might change, and we have tools that I think are underutilized, like gun violence restraining orders. We can use those more. If more people knew about them, used them the way they were designed to be used, we could save lives with them. Uh, with respect to the armed prohibited uh, person system and, and that prohibited list, there are ways we can potentially remove guns out of people's hands before they ever get on the list, as soon as they become prohibited. Um, we know that there's high levels of gun violence related to suicide. There's ways we can address that as well. So we are constantly thinking about ways to be stronger in the legislature. The legislature has put forward some uh, different ideas, uh, the governor uh, as well. And so that's, that's who we are. We can't accept the unacceptable. These are not just, you know, uh, laws matter and judicial decisions matter. These aren't just laws with pieces of paper with fancy words and code sections. They impact people's lives every day. And what we have done in California is something we should be proud of. We have saved lives, more, more lives than we'll ever know. And the, the, the path that we have charted is the right path, and we're going to continue marching down that path. Thank you all very much. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.